Hi everyone, my name is Nikolai. Uh, I'm here to talk about test environments. Uh, hoping to provoke you a bit with my title. Uh, but most of all, I'm hoping to give you some food for thought to bring back to wherever you work. <coughs> I'm going to talk a bit about why I find test environments often a bit problematic and maybe some things to look for and uh, some things we can do to solve these problems I'm highlighting. So what is a test environment? Well, I just this is the Wikipedia. Uh, uh, straight from Wikipedia, the definition from there. Validated, stable, and usable environment to execute test scenarios or replicate bug. Very easy definition, and we can all kind of recognize, uh, feel at home with that uh, uh, definition. And uh, I've been in a lot of different places, a lot of different shops, and usually you'll see something like this. A kind of pipeline from, from left to right, and uh, you don't have to think of this as old monolithic applications, but you can think of maybe each of these as a Kubernetes cluster or a Kubernetes namespace. Like even with microservices, I often see this kind of pipeline. And one thing they have in common is that often it's Conway's law and the, and the organization you're at that defines how many of these blobs you actually have, the, the number of them. And uh, the more you have, the slower it is to reach production usually like the the time from left to right in this uh, pipeline often is defined by how many blobs there are so I want to challenge a bit this usable aspect uh, defined here in the definition because I believe that most test environments are missing the most use uh, use uh, the thing that makes them useful which is realistic usage pattern like of the users using your uh, solution and uh, realistic data, the amount of data, the, uh, how everything is combined. Uh, so you don't really have often the data that, that triggers the actual bugs or the usage in the correct places that actually reveals where your code is not performant enough or something else is wrong. And I dare to say you shouldn't be trying to imitate these usage patterns and these data in your test environments. Most of the time it's impossible or it's way too expensive resource-wise. Uh, and yeah, I think like you have things like synthetic data and all this, but I think like for probably everyone but one person uh, listening right now, it's a waste of time to, to spend too many resources on this. I'll get back to there are maybe a few exceptions, but like for most people, don't spend time or waste time on this. You should instead be much better rigged to work in production. You should be able to test your code and your, uh, how your application works in production without contaminating statistics, uh, metrics, or your data. And I know for some, they don't like this. They think of this as this kind of test-induced uh, design damage reaching into your system. But uh, the example I often give, and I've worked in, in healthcare solutions that didn't have any test environments. And like, for example, Stripe, uh, as a payment API, if you want to have a, a card payment in your application, and yeah, uh, when you test, you don't want to use your real credit card. You want to use one of the test cards that Stripe provide, but that has to be done towards their test environment. So your code is all the same, but you're going to put up another environment that just has this API key change to the test key, right? Instead, I challenge you to just do a if-else kind of feature toggling, like can you mark a user as a test user, and then it uses the test... Uh, uh, card uh, the test stripe API key for example and we did that so I could do like the whole flow in the kind of the real environment with the real database the right amount of rows and everything in the tables and uh, the right kind of amount of pressure on the caching solution right but I could still test and I didn't have to use my own card so just a little like compromise there but I could still test in a much more realistic environment that any test environment I could put up with <laughs> probably no load so let's go back to this one and look at it a bit because I wanted to, for example, do a more traditional example, uh, a place I, I uh, a project I've been on, where uh, it was looking like this. So that because of uh, compliance reasons, uh, it was healthcare. So production had to be on on-prem, uh, and so we needed a QA because uh, the business wanted a, a testing environment to make sure that things were working in production. And as you can see here, there were two cloud environments because. Uh, the on-prem had to be ordered by operations department. So uh, yeah, the development team thought it easier to put up some cloud uh, environments. 
And usually you see something like this, like the dev environment is owned by the development team. This is where you kind of validate things just at the CI after things have been merged and gone out. Then you maybe have a test environment where third party integrators integrate to your APIs and test very easy because you can just wipe the database there in the test environment and stuff like this. You need QA just because you need to know if it actually works on the hardware in production and then you put it in production. For this example, I was saying the whole time that bullshit to have these cloud environments if you know you're going to be on-prem because you are emulating your production environment in the cloud. And in the example here, for example, on-prem it was using RabbitMQ and in the cloud you're using uh, Azure Service Bus. And of course, if you use a library like Mass Transit, like there, are, there are ways to kind of get around this, but you're adding a lot of complexity for an emulated environment that is not your production environment. Waste of time and added complexity. Uh, you should instead like focus more on, on knowing how to handle things in your actual production-like environment. And you should probably work uh, rather on getting better CI, better end-to-end -end testing, this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And you can still write uh, resilient cloud-native 12-factor apps, even if you are deploying on a virtual machine. Like You don't need to be in the cloud to make uh, good uh, applications. We went this far in the end. And I've done this also on like old VMs with IIS where we just switched the web pages and we were running everything like, of course, uh, horizontally scaled, but we didn't have an environment for testing. We became experts at working in production. I want to give, uh, so this is like blue-green uh, green deploys. Um, and yeah, this is where people should have started. Like, don't start with your test environment. Start when you come into a greenfield project or something, start with your production environment. And if you need a test environment, then you can go the other way and create one. But don't start by making test environments. Let's do a quick microservice example. Just to, here's three apps talking together. They are scaled in different ways. They are uh, isolated uh, silos with different teams, right? We all know this. S but I still see a lot of people, it's kind of the same thought about test environments. So, here you have test, QA, and prod, like think of these blobs I showed earlier, but in this case, maybe it's Kubernetes clusters or it's namespaces in Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. And each of these apps, they, they are their own pipeline. Like they first go to test, then to QA, and then to prod. But what I see a lot of the time is that we still have this notion of a, of a, um, a horizontal test environment here. That when you are, let's say we're going to push app A here from test to production without uh, deploying anything of the other two apps. And then we'll see that the first time we're actually testing app A, uh, the version of app A we are deploying against the version of app B that is in production is when it hits production because the versions from before are a uh, higher version. So if you're testing inside, isolated inside these test environments, you don't, you're not 100% sure until it reaches production. So ideally you would have this kind of test or feedback much earlier in your feedback loop, right? Maybe ideally even in a, in a CI pipeline or, or maybe even when you commit, it should say something, hey, I know something about a, a app we're working with or an app that is working with us uh, that is now in production. It won't work with the change you just did. A way to do this is contract testing. It's a bit of a shallow uh, overview. Pact is a great uh, tool to check out. Where's the JVM, also .NET. And it lets you, for example, think of the ideal situation where you, in this case, uh, deployed app A to production, and during the deployment uh, process, there is a contract test that says, hey, uh, this change that we're now deploying, uh, app B is expecting something else, so I'm going to stop the deploy. So that's contract testing. Of course, most uh, good agile teams today, they do it this way, feature totals and backwards compatibility. Like, if you could, if this happens and you could just flick a switch to turn it off, perfect. If it was still backwards compatible, like you have the best of both worlds. But this, it puts a lot of more uh, pressure on your team in how you work, uh, especially in the, you have to be stricter in the peer reviews because suddenly in the peer reviews, you have to think about feature toggling, backwards compatibility, a lot more uh, things for the team to, to, to work on. But if you, kind of work on it together uh, and train over time, you'll get much better at it. Same with like improving delivery time. And this kind of, the, the faster you get uh, at delivering to production when something is done, the more you'll see that you're probably getting measures in place that uh, makes your test environments more and more uh, obsolete. So lead delivery time, great KPI. 
also see a lot like if you have a QA environment like that, you have testers and QA people that are not part of your team, like kind of testing your changes before they are allowed to go production. Instead of these people testing in production and being part of your team, writing automated tests together with you, like, yeah, get your testers on board, please. I love this example, though, smoke detector test. They came to check my uh, smoke detector in my apartment, and I was like realizing, like, holy shit, I'm risking my life from pl <laughs> pressing a plastic button to check if an uh, alarm uh, works. But what I actually want to know is if smoke makes that alarm go off, right? So pushing the button is kind of not enough. You have to use this kind of device to send some smoke into your smoke detector, see that the alarm actually rings on what's supposed to trigger it, and that's not a plastic button. So do you need test environments? It's kind of, and here it comes, it depends. Like, yeah, if you have an iOS app, you should probably test very good in some kind of test environments before you send it to the Apple review that takes uh, two weeks, maybe sometimes. But focus on the real thing, train on the real thing, it's like driving a car around in a parking lot. You don't get good at handling situations in traffic by doing that. So get out there and yeah, uh, maybe you can delete one test environment when you get back to work, right? Thank you so much.